In this video, we'll examine the thermodynamic differences between dissolving ionic substances and molecular substances. The key to understanding these differences is to examine the IMFs that are present in solid substances before they dissolve, both ionic and molecular, and comparing them to the IMFs in the solution. When doing this analysis, we have to keep in mind the IMFs that are holding together different molecules in the solvent and in the solute, and then see how those are replaced in part by interactions between solute and solvent in the solution. And that's true for both dissolving molecular compounds and dissolving ionic compounds. Let's write down those IMFs. To save space, let's use some abbreviations. For London dispersion interactions, we'll just use LDI. For dipole-dipole interactions, we'll use DD. And for hydrogen bonding, we'll use HB. When we dissolve an ionic compound, we'll be using a solvent that might or might not be polar. It's a lot easier to dissolve an ionic comp compound in a polar solvent, which is uh, something we'll discuss in a minute, but we should at least open up the possibility to any kind of solvent. So in principle, we had, could have a solvent that has these interactions. We're always going to have London dispersion interaction. We may or may not have dipole-dipole if our this is only going to be present if we have a, a polar solvent. And if our solvent has both hydrogen bond donors and hydrogen bond acceptors, then in the solvent itself, we're going to find between molecules hydrogen bonding. So these are uh, three interactions, one of which will be present in any solvent, and two of which could be present depending on what the solvent is. We could repeat this, of course, for dissolving molecular compounds. So when we dissolve a molecular compound, uh, the solvent again will have, uh, before we dissolve, when we have the pure solvent, it will have uh, London dispersion, dipole-dipole if it's polar, and hydrogen bonding if it has uh, hydrogen bond donors and acceptors within the compound. So uh, that's what we present in the solvent. But what about the solutes? So for dissolving molecular compounds, the molecular compound is going to have the same situation as the solvent. The thing that holds one solute molecule to another in the solute will be London dispersion, and then if it's a polar compound, dipole-dipole interaction, and if it has hydrogen bond acceptors and donors, then we can also form hydrogen bonds between two solute molecules. So the situation for the solvent and the solute is exactly the same when we dissolve a molecular compound. So for example, if we try to dissolve oil and water, we would see that uh, water has London dispersion, dipole-dipole interaction, and hydrogen bond, hydrogen bonding interaction. Uh, if we look at oil, it's not polar, and so uh, it also doesn't have any hydrogen bond donors or acceptors. So these two are not present, but this is present. So the things in, pr in parentheses are things that might be present depending upon the compound. Now let's look at ionic compounds. So for an ionic solute, the compound is held together almost exclusively by ionic bonding. Ionic bonding is so much stronger than the other interactions that we completely ignore them. So if we look at, for instance, uh, let's try to dissolve sodium chloride in water. So we'd have a lattice of sodium and chloride ions all bound together into a crystal, held together by ionic bonds. And then we'd have a solvent of water, which would be uh, water molecules are held to one another by all three of these types of IMFs. So that's what we have uh, before we make the solution. Now let's look at what we have after we make the solution for both sets of interactions, for dissolving both types of compounds. So when we dissolve an ionic compound, this is what we have before we make our solution. Once our substance dissolves, we add something else, and that's ion-dipole interactions. So every ion is going to be surrounded by the... Uh, so when we make the solution, we're going to add ion-dipole interactions. And if we have a solvent that actually is polar, we'll have just plain ion-dipole interactions. If we have a solvent that isn't polar, so it doesn't have these two, it's a nonpolar solvent, then we're going to add ion-induced dipole interactions. I'll explain the difference between those two on the next slide. 
So those are what we're adding when we make our solution when we have our ionic compounds. So for molecular compounds, when you form your solution, the interaction between the solvent and solute molecules in the solution will be some combination of these interactions. So we're always going to have linear dispersion interaction between any two molecules. And if both of them are polar, we'll have dipole-dipole interaction. And hydrogen bonding, you have to be careful about. To have hydrogen bonding interaction, you need to have a hydrogen bond donor on one compound and on the other end of the hydrogen bond, you've got to have a molecule with a hydrogen bond acceptor. We'll revisit this again in a few minutes. On the next two slides, we'll examine two case studies. First, dissolving an ionic compound, and we'll look at, we'll look at two subcases, doing it in water and doing it in a nonpolar compound. And on the slide after that, we'll look at a case study of dissolving a molecular compound. So let's compare ion dipole and ion induced dipole interactions. So in this case, of course, we're talking about ionic compounds. So let's look at the difference between ion dipole and ion induced dipole interactions. So if we took, for instance, sodium chloride and we dissolved it in water, Around each sodium ion, we'd expect to find a bunch of water molecules with their dipoles, their, the negative end of the dipole, pointing at the sodium. And I don't mean to imply any kind of geometry here, since this is just a flat drawing. The idea is just there's lots of water molecules forming a hydration sphere around this sodium. And of course, you could also have you would also have the same thing happening with the positive end of the dipole with the, with the, with the chloride. So you'd have a bunch of, of water molecules around it as well. Okay, so very nice. So we've got a hydration sphere around each of the ions and they're floating around separately. That's what happens when we dissolve an ionic substance in a polar substance like water. What happens if we try to dissolve an ionic substance in a nonpolar solvent like hexane. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Oops, heptane. We'll use heptane. Okay. Well, this is not a polar substance. But what's going to happen is if we have a sodium ion, and we'll have one of these molecules here. I'll just draw these as sort of blobs here. So we have this blob around the sodium. What's going to happen is the positive charge on here is going to distort the electron cloud in the hexane molecule or the heptane molecule. And so what we're going to do is we're going to induce the electrons in that molecule to shift a little bit towards the sodium. And that's going to make an induced dipole. We're polarizing the molecule. So we can imagine doing that with some some heptane molecules, where the electrons are just the electron clouds are distorted a little bit, like that. And we can see that's going to be an attractive interaction. And we could draw something like that for the chloride too. So here we have what we call an ion-induced dipole interaction, where this ion induces it produces these 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 dipoles that are just they're only there because of the sodium. And over here. When we dissolve in a polar solvent, we have just ion-dipole interactions. And ion-dipole interactions are much stronger than ion-induced dipole interactions. And it's for this reason that when we try to dissolve ionic compounds in nonpolar substances like heptane, we meet with much less success than if we try to dissolve them in water. So there are many salts that are soluble in water. Most salts are not soluble in nonpolar compounds like heptane because the IMFs that you produce are so weak that the overall solution process ends up being very endothermic. Let's do a quick case study for a molecular compound. So for this case study, we'll look at dissolving a molecular compound. So suppose we have this molecule and water. We can look at the IMFs beforehand. 
So for water, of course, we have London dispersion and dipole-dipole and H-bonding interaction. All right, what about this molecule? Well, certainly, as, as always, we have London dispersion interaction. And we know this bond's going to be quite polar, and this isn't flat. So we have a dipole here. So overall, we expect to see a dipole moment. So we'll say dipole-dipole. And uh, this actually, it turns out, has quite a large dipole moment. Now let's look at hydrogen bonding interaction. So let's go ahead and expand this a little bit. We'll put the lone pairs on that we normally don't show in line angle structures. So we have lone pairs on oxygen and nitrogen. Those are good hydrogen bond acceptors, but do we have any hydrogen bond donors? Well, we know this is a methyl group and it has hydrogens on it, but they're not directly attached to a nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine, so they won't work. Same thing for these hydrogens. There's a hydrogen that's normally not shown in a line angle on the back of this aldehyde, and notice that it is not directly attached to an oxygen. It's instead, it's attached to this carbon. So this cannot act as a hydrogen bond uh, donor as well. So this molecule cannot hydrogen bond with another molecule just like it. But what about with water? When we make the mixture, we could, in fact, imagine taking our molecule and... I'll redraw it as we did before with, I'll expand it a little bit to show this implicit hydrogen and the lone pairs. I could certainly form a hydrogen bond here with this water molecule. So I'll show it with a different color here. So we certainly could find, we could form a hydrogen bonding interaction once we form the mixture. And of course, we're still going to have London dispersion interaction and dipole-dipole interaction. So notice that now we're going to have all three. So when you're analyzing the thermodynamics of solution formation, be aware that you could have a compound that doesn't have hydrogen bonding in uh, uh, just a collection of molecules that are identical. But when you mix it with another molecule, you can get a new interaction. So here we had a hydrogen bond acceptor. We've got hydrogen bond donors and water. So if we get these two molecules next to each other, we can form a hydrogen bond where we didn't have one in just this pure solute. The last difference between ionic and molecular compounds when we dissolve them is their effect on colligative properties because they differ in their van Hoff factor I. Now I've written out the equations for freezing point depression, boiling point elevation, and osmotic pressure. And these, uh, there's there's worked videos for each of these, uh, so you can see how they're applied. Uh, and I'll just so I'll, I'll just uh, very quickly state what they are. This says that if I dissolve a solute in something, the melting point goes down. If I dissolve a solute in something, the boiling point of that solvent goes up. And that if I have a semi-permeable membrane that there'll be a pressure difference across that membrane caused by the presence of the solute. In any case, all of these have an I. And the I is the number of particles produced per molecular formula for a substance. So what we see is for all molecular solvents, for all molecular So the difference between molecular solutes and ionic solutes is the size of that I we call the van Hoff factor. So for molecular solutes, it's just one. For ionic solutes, it's some larger number. And the reason for this is that you produce more than one particle for form per formula unit. So let's imagine that you had lithium phosphate. We know that when lithium phosphate dissolves, you get three lithium ions for every unit of salt. And we get one phosphate. In other words, we get four particles. And since, at least for ideal solutions, the colligative properties are based on entropy, the more particles you produce, the more entropy you produce. The more particles are produced, the more the Gibbs energy of the 
solvent is going to be changed, and so that's factored in in these equations. So if you're using ionic, ion, if you're looking, so if you have an ionic solute, don't forget to see how many ions are in each formula and include that number as your I vent Hoff factor when you're calculating colligative properties.